Hello everyone. Uh, we're starting our management introduction to management lesson today. Uh, we'll start with chapter seven, which is for, from planning to inspiration, the functions of management. Chapter overview. In this chapter, we'll explore the four basic functions of management. Planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Along the way, you'll see how managers get their companies pointed in the right direction by starting with a vision and the mission statement, the anchors of the strategic planning process. Following a brief look at crisis planning, the chapter dives into organization, leading and controlling, then concludes with a discussion of the skills you will need in order to be an effective manager. The four basic ma uh, functions of management, the four basic functions of management, planning, organizing, leading and controlling, resources and land, labor, capital and information to efficiently reach a company's goals. In the course of performing the four management functions, managers play a number of, role, number of roles that fall into three main categories interpersonal roles, informational roles, and decisional roles. Now, looking at interpersonal roles, management is largely a question of getting work accomplished through the efforts of other people. So managers must play a number of interpersonal roles, including providing leadership to employees building relationships and acting as a liaison between groups and individuals both inside and outside the company. Informational roles. Managers spend a fair amount of time gathering information from sources both inside and outside the organization. They also distribute information to employees other managers and other stakeholders. Deci decisional roles, from deciding how to respond to a customer, complaint to deciding whether to acquire another company or develop a new product line, managers up and down the organizational ladder face an endless stream of decisions. Being able to move among these roles while performing the four basic management functions is just one of the many skills that managers must possess. But these functions are not discrete. They overlap and influence one another. The following sections provide a closer look. The planning function, managers engage in planning when they develop strategies for success, establish goals and objectives for the organization and translate their strategies and goals into action plans. Planning can be considered the primary management function because it drives all the other functions. To develop long-term strategies and goals, managers must be well informed on a number of key issues and topics that could influence their decisions. A closer look at the strategic planning process will give you a clearer idea of the types of information managers need to help them plan for the company's future. Understanding the strategic planning process. Strategic plans outline the firm's long range uh, often two to five years, organizational goals and set a course of action the firm will pursue to reach its goals. One of the most important questions at this stage is the company's business model. A clear, simple outline of how the business intends to generate revenue. Business models often change over time too. Beyond the fundamental business model, a good strategic plan answers such important questions as where are we going and how do we get there? What is the business environment going to be like? 
The strategic planning process consists of seven interrelated steps. Developing a clear vision, creating a mission statement, performing a SWOT analysis, developing forecasts, analyzing the competition, establishing goals and objectives, and developing action plans. Strategic planning should be a never-ending process as you establish strategies, measure outcomes, monitor changes in the business environment and make adjustments as needed. The history of business is full of companies that no longer exist because they were unwilling or unable to redirect their strategies as the world changed around them. Now, develop a clear vision. Most organizations are formed in order to realize a vision, a realistic and achievable view of the future that grows out of and improves on the present. Translate the vision into a meaningful mission statement. A vision statement gives the company a clear target, but to translate that vision into a reality, managers must define specific organizational goals, objectives and philosophies. A good starting point is to write a mission statement if a brief articulation of why your organization exists, what it seeks to accomplish, and the principles that the company will adhere to as it tries to reach its goals. In other words, a mission statement communicates what the company is, what it does, and where it is headed. Typical components of a mission statement include the company's product or service, primary market, fundamental concern for survival, growth and profitability, managerial philosophy and commitment to quality and social responsibility. Assess the company's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Before establishing long-term goals, you need to have a clear assessment of your firm's strengths and weaknesses compared with the opportunities and threats it's facing. Such analysis is commonly referred to as SWOT, which stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities and Threats. Identifying a firm's internal strengths and weaknesses helps management understand its current abilities so it can set proper goals. Strengths are positive internal factors that contribute to a company's success which can be anything <coughs> from a team of expert employees to financial resources to unique technologies. Weaknesses are negative internal factors that inhibit the company's success such as obsolete facilities or inadequate financial resources. Excelling in many areas at once is unrealistic for most firms, so managers frequently choose to focus on developing a small number of strengths known as core competences. A core competence is a bundle of skills, technologies and other resources that enable a company to provide a particular benefit to customers. It sets the company apart from its competitors and is difficult for competitors to duplicate. Once you have taken inventory of your company's internal strengths and weaknesses, your next step is to identify the external opportunities and threats that might affect your ability to attain desired goals. Opportunities are positive external situations that represent the possibility of generating new revenue. Shrewd managers and entrepreneurs recognize opportunities before others do and then promptly act on their ideas. In still other cases, entrepreneurs 
or managers envision markets that do not even exist yet. Creating new markets is usually an expensive, complicated and risky move, but if you are successful, you instantly become the industry leader. Threats are negative forces that could inhibit the firm's ability to achieve its objectives. Most threats are external, but a few, such as workplace violence, can appear internally as well. External threats include new competitors, new government regulations, economic recession, disruptions in supply, technological advances that render products obsolete, theft of intellectual property, product liability lawsuits, and even the weather. Now, developing forecasts. Planning requires managers to predict the future, but forecasting is notoriously difficult and prone to errors. Not only do you need to predict what will or what will not occur, but when it will occur and how it will affect your business. At the same time, forecasting is crucial to every company's success because it influences virtually every important decision. Managerial forecasts fall under two broad categories. Quantitative forecasts, which are typically based on historical data or tests and often involve complex statistical computations, and qualitative forecasts, which are based more on intuitive judgments. Analyzing cycles of economic growth and recession over several decades to predict when the economy will take a downturn, downward turn is an example of quantitative forecasting. Predict the response of competitors to a new product is an example of qualitative forecasting. Regardless of the type of forecast or the variables being predicted, reliable inputs are key. Forecasters collect pertinent data and information in a wide variety of ways, such as reviewing internal data, conducting surveys and other research, purchasing industry forecasts from research companies, and reviewing projections from the many periodicals, industry organizations and government agencies that publish forecasts on business and economic issues. Now we come to analyze the competition. Every effort to implement strategy takes place in a competitive context. With insight into its own capabilities and those of its competitors, a company can then work to gain a competitive edge through at least one of three basic strategies. Differentiation, cost leadership and focus. Differentiation. A company using differentiation develops a level of service, a product image, unique product features, including quality, or new technologies that distinguish its product from competitors' products. Cost leadership. The premier example of cost leadership is Walmart, which revolutionized retailing with business processes that constantly seek to improve efficiency and cost effectiveness. And the third one, which is focus. When using a focus strategy, companies concentrate on a specific segment of the market, seeking to develop a better understanding of those customers and to tailor products specifically to their needs. Now we come to establish company goals and objectives. Establishing goals and objectives is the key task in the planning process. A goal is a broad, long-range accomplishment that the organization wants to attain in typically five or more years, whereas an objective is a specific, short-range target designed to help reach that goal. To be effective, organizational goals and objectives should be specific, measurable, relevant, 
challenging, attainable, and time limited. Setting appropriate goals has many benefits. It increases employee motivation, establishes standards for measuring individual and group performance, guides employee activity, and clarifies management expectations. Um, develop action plans. Once you have established long-term strategic goals and objectives, your next step is to develop a plan of execution. Tactical plans. Lay out the actions and the allocation of resources necessary to achieve specific short-term objectives that support the company's broader strategic plan. Tactical plans typically focus on departmental goals and cover a period of one to three years. Their limited scope permits them to be changed more easily than strategic plans. Operational plans. Designate the actions and resources required to achieve the objectives of tactical plans. Operational plans usually define actions for less than one year and focus on accomplishing specific objectives, such as securing additional financing or opening a new retail challenge. Sorry, a retail channel. Coming up with a brilliant strategy is only a small part of the equation of succession. Executing is what counts. Planning for a crisis. No matter how well a company plans for its future, any number of problems can arise to threaten its existence. Managers can help a company survive these setbacks through crisis management. A plan for handling such unusual and serious problems, the goal of crisis management is to keep the company functioning smoothly, but both during and after a crisis. Companies that respond quickly with the information people need tend to fare much better in these circumstances than those that go into hiding or release bits and pieces of in uncoordinated or inconsistent information. The plan should clearly specify the people who are authorized to speak for the company contact information for all key executives and the media outlets and technologies that will be used to disseminate information. Now we come to the organizing function. Organizing the process of arranging resources to carry out the organization's plans is the second major function of managers. During the organizing stage, managers think through all the activities that employees carry out as well as all the facilities and equipment employees need in order to complete those activities. They also give people the ability to work toward organizational goals by determining who will have the authority to make decisions to perform or supervise activities and to distribute resources. The organizing function is particularly challenging because most organizations undergo constant change, so management's organizing tasks are never finished. The three levels of a typical corporate hierarchy, top, middle, bottom, commonly known as the management pyramid. In general, top managers are the upper level managers who have the most power and who take overall responsibility for the organization. Top managers establish the structure for the organization as a whole and they select the people who fill the upper level positions. Top managers also make long range plans, establish major policies and represent the company to the outside world at official functions and fundraisers. The term executive applies to top managers. 
Middle managers have similar responsibilities, but on a smaller scale, such as for an individual department or facility. The term middle management is, somewhere, is somewhat vague, but in general, managers at this level report upward to top executives, while first-line managers report to them. In other words, they usually manage other managers, not workers. A smaller company might have a single layer of middle management or non, none at all in many cases, whereas a large corporation could have a half a dozen or more layers of middle managers. Many companies are flattening their organizational structures largely by removing layers of middle management. At the bottom of the management pyramid are first-line managers or supervisory managers. They oversee the work of operating employees and they put into action the plans developed at higher levels. Positions at this level include supervisor, department head and office manager. <coughs> and now we have come to the end of this lesson. Um, I thank you very much. We'll carry on the rest of the chapter 7 in the following lesson. Thank you very much.